I'm excited to share with everyone that today's webcast is a little bit different. We'll be having a panel discussion and we'll be looking at where we're heading and critically exploring how and what we can do to get there. Embracing the revolution of tech in the digital age requires a different approach to the way work gets done. In fact, our panel today is a prime example. We have Roger in San Francisco, David and Adrian in New York City, and myself here in lovely Cincinnati. In this webcast, we'll learn about the evolution of work and how organizations are adapting to change while discovering real-world examples of companies that are embracing a new vision. Today's panel will be answering some hot questions and addressing some very current challenges. What's interesting about all of our speakers is that they've spent their careers in a variety of industries working in large organizations before using their knowledge and experience to create solutions. They've all built strategies to revolutionize the way organizations adapt to the workforce of the future. The nature of their careers means that they have a unique view of most of the boardrooms in many of the world's largest and most impactful companies. And interestingly enough, we know that this is a huge topic area for those of you listening, because when you signed up to attend this webinar, we asked you all a question. Is the transformation to the workforce and the war for talent a high enough priority within your organization? The majority of respond responders answered yes, over half of you in fact. So I want to thank everybody for your participation in this quick survey, just to give us an idea of who's in our audience today, and we'll look at some more of your responses a little bit later in the webcast. And now to get things started, let's go ahead and meet today's panelists. Adrian, why don't you get us started? Great, thank you, Randy. I'm delighted to be with everyone here today. I generally describe the thread of my career as human behavior, initially focused in marketing and consumer behavior, and ultimately moving that forward into organizations and workers. I find there's actually a lot of parallels between marketing and talent management. I worked in PR early in my career and actually built some early internet websites. Tech has definitely changed a lot since then. Um, but it's actually this precise moment uh, for me during preterm of business school where I heard a radio program um, mentioning Wayne Baker. And he's a professor at the University of Michigan. And he was talking about social networks. And having done early work in internet and seeing how disruptive that had been in organizations, that was my moment. And I said, this is it. So many organizations struggle to adapt to change. And it made so much sense to me. That was then my ongoing focus and my studies and then work continuing on in organization development. So I became a consultant in Deloitte's human capital practice where I focused on organization design and change and talent, actually involved in some of the first methods of integrated talent management. And um, things have obviously continued to evolve since then. Um, and then worked um, inside in financial services organizations in the talent performance, engagement, talent analytics um, type of space. And so had this mix and of external consulting and being inside organizations. So hopefully that relates to a number of, of different perspectives here. And um, I joined forces then with a former Deloitte colleague of mine. He has a similar background of having come from consulting and corporate perspectives. And we also had a very shared passion for connecting people and ideas. So we decided actually where we could have this impact in business. Um, and, and helping people um, was from a different angle in executive search. So we started on Point HR in 2009, and it's a search boutique fo focused exclusively on roles in people-related functions, whether you call that HR or human capital or OD, talent. But we help organizations of all different shapes and sizes and industries and connect with people from very diverse backgrounds and skill sets to help them find one another. And um, it's been very exciting to be a part of this putting game changers in the people function. It's definitely proven to be an area for critical competitive advantage and moving forward in the workforce. Happy to be here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adrian, for joining us. And now, David, could you share us uh, share a little bit about yourself with our audience? Sure. Thanks very much. And hi, everyone. This is Dave Palmieri. It's uh, really great to be with you all. So my, my background, um, just to sum it up, is is essentially 25 years of uh, large-scale change management. So it's, it's always been focused on um, financial services and with a particular focus on uh, the, the human aspects of change, um, everything from uh, you know, merger uh, and acquisition integration to um, you know, organizational change and redesign uh, to things that involve insourcing and outsourcing of roles from, uh, from companies. And uh, a lot of it has to do, frankly, with how you um, look at the workforce from a, uh, a more holistic resource strategy perspective. So it's not just about 
you know, hey, how do we move roles to India or to Costa Rica or where have you, but more about how do we, um, you know, establish a global capability, tap into great talent pools in a way that actually supports the business strategy, um, allows us to tap into um, great skills and experience uh, that promotes diversity, and ultimately helps serve clients uh, better and better. So the days of looking at resource strategy, let's say, as a means to, hey, let's, let's just reduce cost, those, those days are long gone. I, I think the expectation is there, of course, that, that you'll see some tangible benefit through a resource strategy, but it's much more about um, top talent um, and serving clients and being more innovative and more capable in a way that aligns to your business strategy. So it's, it's massively important that, um, you know, that we begin to think differently about you know, the global workforce, the war for talent, which is, I think, one of our big topics for today. And, you know, do we have tools and capability to actually um, leverage those skills and experience uh, on a more global basis? So not just the people that sit outside your office or across the floor, but, you know, that team in, in uh, Bangalore or Singapore or Costa Rica or, you know, midtown Manhattan in a way that maybe you haven't before. That, that untapped uh, capacity and willingness to do things um, in areas that are of particular interest to people, I think is, uh, is really an amazing frontier that um, should be on everyone's radar. Another um, big area that I'm excited about, and it's so much so that um, I actually stepped out of Wall Street at a, you know, for, for the past uh, you know, 25 years and uh, started a company called Rapid RPA. So um, RPA is, um, is basically an acronym. It it's, uh, stands for Robotic Process Automation. And I'm sure you know, you've either experienced it directly, you know, your company may be piloting or, or putting robots into production, but it's, it's an amazing opportunity to uh, complement your workforce. And I, you know, I hear all the time people are concerned about robotics and eliminating roles, and I just don't see it that way. I think it's actually a tool that people use the way you would use any other tool to help people become more efficient and effective in their role and ultimately, ultimately become much more satisfied in what it is they're doing. So and I think you're all used to seeing this, right? You do an employee survey every year and one of the big comments is, hey, I, I wish I had the tools to do my job more effectively and more efficiently. And Robotics is exactly that, right? It gives you the ability to get work done, typically the more routine and mundane parts of your job, job that people just don't get excited about. It gives you, you, the user, an ability to automate that for, you know, almost immediate benefit. I mean, it's, it's quite remarkable. So, so, you know, the effects of that on HR, I think, are quite profound. I think even with a, a more automated workforce, you know, the role of HR is, is more compelling and, and more important than ever. So. Uh, so that's why I'm here. I'm really excited to uh, to join all of you all on this call today. And I'm, I'm going to hand it over to Roger Gorman. Thanks, David. Oh, fantastic. Thank <laughs> Thanks so much. So hi, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. So yes, Roger Gorman, um, CEO of ProFinder. I guess I am the sort of token Brit. Uh, I think every webinar probably needs one, at least one. Uh, so here I am. Um, so my, of course, 60 seconds on me. I, my background is essentially a, a blend of behavioral psychology and uh, digital innovation. So I've spent sort of the last 15, well, first 15 years of my career um, working inside massive organizations, um, observing and trying to help and support how they innovate more intelligently, engage their workforce more intelligently, etc. Um, and then the latter part was actually doing it on behalf of big consultancies for their clients. So I guess I was really privileged to see such an array of different scenarios across different sort of functions, sectors, and so on. Um, um, probably more recently than the last five years have been spent working building this business. Um, and the bit I'm going to mention that's probably of most interest is just the privilege of sitting in so many boardrooms of so many businesses, but then also sitting with the folk in the trenches and just getting a sense uh, across pretty much, I mean, most, most large brands that we know of um, around, the, around the world. Um, and getting, a, a, I guess, a, a narrative of where the, 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 the commonality is and where the challenges are, the opportunities. And, you know, clearly every firm is on this journey of this sort of workforce of the future um, at all at different stages, different times. Um, and I think my, my sort of conclusion point is there is 
both so much inefficiency and so much so much gap, but at the same time, therefore, so much potential. And I love the fact that these experiences like the webinars exist because what it's showing is obviously a, a very, very real hunger to cross-fertilize, to, to understand each other, and to understand what's happening, where the best practice is. If there's something that's incredibly working very, very well in pharmaceutical, how can we apply that to FMCG and so on? So um, back to us, I think one of the common threads that came out of uh, the introduction from Adrian and David is the idea of you know, smart technology enabling humans to, to really bring them together more virtuously and more ex in a sort of more exciting way. Um, which is really, I think, is one of the underpinning items of workforce in the future. So yeah, um, that's a little about me, and I'm just very, very excited to get into this uh, the session. Roger, thank you so much, and a big welcome to all of our panelists today. Let's go ahead and dive right into our content. I know we have a lot to cover in a what will probably be a short hour, so let's get started. One of the big things that we want to talk about today is cultural transformation. At some point, every firm, and perhaps some of our webcast attendees are undergoing this even as we speak, every firm will undergo some kind of transformational change. What's often misunderstood is that maybe the challenge to really succeeding in that change isn't in the technology, but it's actually about the people and the culture. And it, in fact, many of our webcast attendees agree. As part of the survey that we ran while you were signing up for the webcast, we asked all of you, what is the major blocker for transformational change in an organization? And the vast majority of our respondents answered attitude and culture. Over two thirds of you believe that attitude and culture is a major blocker for transformational change. So my question to our panelists today is, if the assertion is that it comes down to people and attitude, how do we really move the dial on attitude so that we can drive behavior in line with organizational processes? Roger, why don't you take your first stab at that? Right, okay, thank you. Um, probably, probably the place to start, I think, on this, this topic is actually looking at what is the DNA of a business, actually. If we, step, if we move ourselves completely outside the organization and look at it from a thousand feet, I think there are three main pillars to an organization that make it work. Um, the one is not your individual IQ point, but your collective knowledge, your collective sort of um, insight. So we might call that sort of knowledge capital. Um, the next item is not just your black book, but basically your collective black book. So obviously we can call that social capital. And the third, which I really love, is this notion of attitude capital. So you could easily subscribe that to being culture. Um, but really, when you think of those three things, which are really kind of the whole point of being a large organization, they're about people, knowledge, and network, um, and therefore attitude around that, is for the longest time, it's been divided as a formula, almost divided by infrastructure. So because technology hasn't really been working as efficiently as it could, the, the ability to connect our knowledge and the ability to collect our attitude and so on has been basically uh, reduced. Um, and I think the formula needs to spin on its head where you actually start to multiply these things together. So obviously the tech and the infrastructure and indeed the culture is a multiplying facet to actually end up with an exponential sort of growth in the organization. Um, if, I, if I sort of play that through, I mean, really fundamentally as I see it, there's a massive disconnect right now with the workflow and people. Um, and, I, and I think really that if there was a sort of cheat sheet, a sort of uh, a blueprint to get it right, um, and it's obviously nothing is ever this simple, but I think what we need to strive for is a, is a situation where we're aligning the win conditions. Um, and what, this, what we're talking about here is there is a win condition for an organization. Um, there's also a sequence of win conditions for the people that run division and divisional heads, for example. And if we if we sort of say, if we've been quite honest with ourselves, we've probably seen lots of divisional heads in complete. Um, uh, they've got different agendas because it's been set by management, senior management. So we need to align those. And then you think about the person in the trenches, the worker bee. They have their win conditions, but what are they? So the quest I think that we're on is how do you align these win conditions from the organisation, the, 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 the departments and indeed the individuals. And I think if you can align those win conditions, um, then we're into a much better place. Thank you, Roger. David, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I, you know, listening to, to Roger's comments, I, I really could not agree more um, with, with what Roger's saying. I mean, it's, it is, um, I think historically, it's been difficult, if not impossible, to actually know what people are doing, let alone what their interests or, or capacity is. To, to do work. So I, I think the point around uh, the wind conditions, I, I think, is really, really spot on. So now we're at a point where, you know, the capability and the tools are out there to understand where people have an interest in, in activities at, at the enterprise level that actually align to their interests. Um, we also have an opportunity to see for the first time, um, and these tools are out there today, they're in production, um, 
you know, where you can actually see what people are working on, um, how much of that work is, um, is manual in nature, so you can start to target solutions specifically to, to them, right? And what, by doing that, um, by building that understanding where you, you, you know what people are working on and you understand their capacity and desire to um, gain certain experiences, you're, you're able to modify their behavior. I mean, I just to I mean to just put it very plainly, if I'm continually told to do things that don't really align to my career interests, I become less interested, less engaged, less productive. However, if I'm if I'm engaged in a way where you know I'm I'm known uh, as as an employee, and I'm served up opportunities that you know reflect my capacity and my interests. I, that's a complete game changer for me, right? So it's it's not about creating a huge bureaucracy. It's re, it's really just about leveraging the data that you have so that you can engage people better than you have in the past. I mean, a great analogy is you know when you when you shop on uh, Amazon, right? Amazon knows you really, really, really well. I mean, there could be something like that inside the enterprise that knows you really well, where you can. Say you know what I would love that that experience, right? And you're able to identify yourself who would love to take on that that project, even if it takes a few minutes to do, even if it's just helping someone else out in the organization. Um, that's that's a big deal, right? So you're continually adding value in ways that sometimes are within your job definition, but maybe are sometimes outside of that. But just because of your experiences, you're able to help that person that that could be somewhere on the other side of the world. So I. I think, you know, when I think about attitude that drives behavior, I think that ability to know and respect the person in a, in a more um, detailed way than we have in the past, I think is, uh, is a huge game changer uh, for organizations today. Awesome. Thank you, David. And Adrian, what are your thoughts on win conditions? I, I absolutely agree with a lot of what Roger and David spoke about. I think for me, I always come back to this idea of change being about hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's one at a time. Um, but I think if you, it's about setting the right context for that to happen and then getting to the individual. Um, Roger, I love that you talked about DNA because I think there's so much we can learn from science. One of my favorite reads is Margaret Wheatley's book from the 1980s where she looks at quantum physics and cellular biology and is proving out that leadership and communications can be far more powerful stage setters and change agents than process and systems alone. Not to say that those things, when they're in alignment, don't work really well, but that it is that overall context. Where is the leadership coming from? How are we talking about these things in a very consistent way in the organization? Um, for me, looking at some of our startup clients, it's very easy to see. They have a severe lack of infrastructure, but an abundance of culture, shared attitude, behavior. There's a ton of passion that people join for. They're not joining for pocketbook. And that really shines through initially. So it's kind of thinking about how do you capture some of that early excitement and think about the foundations of an organization and, and what its mission really is. Um, so I think for, for the larger organizations, if we, if we think startups really have something special in what they're able to do in a smaller setting, how do we look at larger organizations? And I think it comes to people have very similar motivators across the board. Um, and there's some recent work that I've been exposed to, um, actually a fellow Wharton classmate of mine, um, Neil Doshi and his firm Vega Factor, and they've created this framework of positive motivation. And I, there are a lot of different frameworks, but this one particularly spoke to me because it really is about how do you look at, at people in their role and, and these components of what are the aspects that need to be well, that need to be there to make my work relevant and engaging. Um, and so we have a nice kind of easy acronym, and it's, it's about play, it's about purpose, and it's about potential. And, and these three pieces then getting at this individual level. So how, do, how are you motivated by the work itself? Is it playful? Do you love the work, right? We think about this with our, our children, too, and we know that even adult learning, the more fun it is, the more it sticks, right? So how do we make it more playful? purpose motivated by the outcome? What's the value of, and that you place on the impact you are having of the work that you're doing? And this concept of potential, which really gets us again to this forward future look, are you working on something today that gets you somewhere you want to be in the future? And that again is this alignment of pieces that Roger spoke about and that many of us, I think when we have these 
play, purpose, and potential pieces all working together, it feels like flow, being in the zone. We know it and feel it when it's all really jiving. And I think that's what leads to productivity, and, um, and, but it's also different for everybody, right? So what, what works for me in these three components, it can be different than what works for someone else. And so ultimately, it's this very transparent conversation between managers and employees that I think can move that attitude forward. And as David indicated, we start with needing to know what people's desires are. What do they want to do? Which means we have to ask them. Do you love your work? What parts of it do you love most? Is, this, is the purpose of your work aligned with the impact you want to have? Are you doing something that is getting you toward what your goals are? And let's have a real conversation about what that goal you're working toward is. And ultimately, I, I get it, right? There needs to be a safe space for these conversations and then the ability to act on them. So that does require trust, which is a conversation I think we're going to touch on a little bit later in the panel. Um, but, but I really think it's these components of looking at what's the context that you are creating that makes it a safe space, and how do we have these very individual conversations about work and purpose and potential. Thank you, Adrian. And I think you did lead us right into our next topic for discussion. You mentioned simply having conversations about work. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, many organizations are taking a closer look, reevaluating their performance management, performance review systems. We are moving away from the annual appraisal and looking at new ways to interact with our employees and keep better um, keep ourselves better informed of what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, a lot of folks out there, I think, would agree that the uh, annual appraisal is dead. So let's talk about that a little bit more. Um, looking at this theme, and I think we'll uh, stick with uh, you, Adrian, first. I know you've spent part of your career working in the highly regulated financial services industry. So from your view of the market, what problems do you think exist with the old model of performance reviews? Uh, definitely uh, the issues abound, um, but I think saying appraisals are dead might be a little bit premature and aspirational. I think they're evolving, um, but dead maybe not yet. Uh, we've seen a lot of professional services firms move on. Um, many newer organizations just never start using them, or they don't until they get to a certain size. Um, but I see a lot of organizations where performance management processes are alive and well, um, some moving and progressing, but not throwing the entire thing out. And I think it's really about asking this, this question of what are, the, what are the pieces of it that we do want to retain that have value, and what are the things that aren't working. So you, you asked about what are some of the things that don't work in traditional performance reviews. Firsthand, when I was working at, at Barclays in performance management, it was very clear right away that one size doesn't fit all. And yet a lot of the supporting processes and technology sort of drive us to this idea that different workforces have some very different work that they need to get done, very different feedback that comes directly from the work, and measurement then becomes different, and, and even the soft skills around the way people work can be different, but yet there's this drive for conformity. Um, and so, so I think that's definitely one of the pieces that, that um, maybe consistency makes it easier, but easier doesn't necessarily mean it's accurate or driving better performance in the future or motivating engagement with the organization. Um, and certainly, I don't think it takes into account today, many of these processes don't take into account the context um, within somebody is working, the larger macro environment, um, as well as um, teamwork. So there's so much we're trying to get down to an individual's contribution, and yet we know that there's a multiplying effect of teamwork. Um, so when I was at Barclays, what we started with was what was a radical idea at the time was that we, there would be more value in coaching conversations than in ratings. And so let's throw it out all together, get rid of the ratings. Uh, ultimately, that was a little uh, too far of a step, um, but ended up looking again at why are we doing this? What's, what are we really looking for? And so did move forward in a balance of both what and how. And we see this with companies like American Express and PepsiCo where they create these balances of what, not only what is the person working on and achieving and how does that work toward the strategy, but how do they do their work? And, um, and so that becomes a, a bit more um, not just achieving at all costs. And the encouragement of thoughtful written feedback by managers. So in, in our solution at Barclays, it was looking for more uh, qualitative than quantitative. Saying this was really encouraging the conversation and the meaningful discussion that we were looking to, to move toward in a coaching style conversation. 
um, and also didn't then land in a single numerical rating, but had this idea of action-oriented description, the sort of a summary statement. And that, that helps people to understand, okay, I'm doing well, and I'm poised for these things in the future. So those components, interestingly, I, I would say also, I would point to my alma mater, Deloitte, uh, they're a great case study for stepping back and asking, why are we doing this? What value are we looking to create in the performance process? And what they found is that some of the most telling feedback comes in the form of simple questions. And they're future-oriented. Would you work with this person again? Would you put them into a role with more responsibility? So it's not about what do you think of them, but what would you do with them? So this action lens can be much more compelling. And I think organizations who foster this concept of regular open conversations between managers and their teams, they're the ones that are winning. They're winning in engagement, retention, and development, because now they know what are the missing skills, what are the aspirational skills, and they're winning at showing employees a more compelling vision of their career. When you're talking about where is this going, you now have this open conversation about your career, and quite honestly, it makes it much more difficult for external organizations to attract them, because they know how, how they're doing, how they're being supported, and where they're going in their future at your firm. Thank you, Adrian. Let's next turn to David. David, what are your thoughts here on annual appraisals and where those might be going in the future? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I hate performance reviews. <laughs> I hate to give them and I hate to receive them. Um, what I really like, though, is coaching people. Um, and I think the, the point that Adrian made about the, the what and the how is so important, right? If you're just judging on results, you may be giving a very high performance review to someone who leaves nothing but you know scorched earth behind them, and you know clearly we don't want that. So in, in my mind, you know the way of um, the past, with, you know, which has been you know, annual performance reviews, you need to have a really exceptional memory uh, to think back to all the great things that have been done over the past year. Um, in some instances, you have a situation where you know, um, you're as good as the, that most recent thing, right, whether it is good or not so good. So I think more frequent um, discussions about the what and the how in the form of uh, coaching sessions and, and situations that are less, I'll say, um, bureaucratic or forced in, in, their, uh, in their nature are massively more productive um, than I think your traditional means of uh, doing annual performance appraisals. In my mind, they only serve to um, disincent people because generally speaking, you know, when, um, people know when they're doing a good job, an okay job, or uh, a poor job in their role. So I think, you know, ongoing coaching, I think, um, is more natural. I think it uh, allows you to continually raise the bar and, and really help that person develop and course correct if, if, they're, if that's needed. So I, I'm much more in favor of, of coaching as a means to um, ensure you have alignment on what the objectives are and coaching around you know, how work has actually gotten done. So um, if we're moving in that direction um, you know, holistically, that's fantastic. I know a lot of firms are thinking about it. But I see more situations where there's, um, there's a, 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 an interest in maintaining the status quo only because they don't know what to do next, right? What is that next best, best step? If not the annual performance appraisal, how do we actually do this? How do we actually get a read on how well people are performing in their role? And I, I think that's the nut that um, you're really trying to uh, crack at this point. But um, you know, thinking back, Randy, to the first question that we covered, you know, people that are served up work that actually align to their interests and what their desires are uh, from a career path perspective are going to perform better, right? They want um, activities and, and responsibilities that they know they can knock out of the park, right? So if, if a person is known and understood um, and they're given the tools to do their, their job, um, based on their interests, you're, you're going to have a, a massively more successful person and someone who's far more productive and, and uh, satisfied in their role. So, you know, just to sort of link the two questions together, uh, I, I think, you know, if um, the performance conversation or coaching conversation is far 
easier and more productive if you can point to um, instances where you know you're you're giving work to a person that um, that's that's based on their actual career interests and their experiences. So. David, I'm glad you mentioned trust. I think it requires a lot of trust for having those coaching conversations and also having those change management conversations. Um, Roger, why don't you share a little bit of your thoughts with us on establishing a currency of trust? Um, yeah, I think exactly, that's actually a really neat segue for what I was wanting to get into. I sort of like to approach this from the, that sort of slightly different angle, perhaps, in that. Um, you know, if we look at the blueprints to what is workforce of the future, it's kind of quote unquote easy to see where it's going, where it's come from, where it's going. So, for example, in in appraisals, I mean, I really like um, Adrian's um, uh, acknowledgement that, of course, perhaps the fact that annual appraisals are dead is is a is an aspirational quality, but we all do know that annual appraisals aren't working, or at the very least, aren't working well. So there must be uh, an enrichment of that process, um, and. So what we're looking for, if you look at that blueprint of workforce the future, clearly a massive part of where we need to get to is real-time feedback loops, and that's that's enabled by a digital experience. Um, but I think the focus for so that that sort of technology solution actually is kind of easy, right? So I think that you know that's that's something we can take and say, look, we're we're getting there. But I think that for this discussion, I think the focus really should be around the psychology because as these organisations are expanding and changing, we're talking about typically again back to that workforce the future blueprint. Organizations are, are becoming more amorphous. They're becoming wide and different. The, the borders are changing. Um, and so, you know, there is a, something that some companies, 34 to 43% of, uh, of these companies are contingent. contingent. So these are, these are floating agents who are able to jump in out of projects. Well, with these changing dimensions, you're basically dealing with greater interactions, a greater volume of interactions more frequently. And if, unless we think about trust, um, we're, gonna have a tr we're gonna have trouble. Um, and in order to keep this thing moving forward and fast at the right rate, in order for us to both be a, a, a value member and get something from the program, but also reach into the networks that are, you know, forget the word company, we should be thinking about the word ecosystem. Um, we need to find a way to, um, what's the fuel and what's the oxygen? I think it really is around the currency of trust. Um, and fundamentally, it's because we are social creatures. So we need to do, you know, we, we like, and there's a, there's a term called homophily, which is essentially um, around the fact that we, we like and we align to people, we gravitate to people a little bit like us, which is one of the reasons diversity and inclusion has always been a, a challenge. Um, but because we're social creatures, we have to think about solving in that way. And, and I think there's been some magnificent successes in the B2C space, and it's never really been um, assimilated to the corporate market. So take TripAdvisor. You know, I, I did a quick scan a few weeks ago, and I found a hotel in Greece, which I was suddenly thinking of, because 3,000 people had said it was a five out of five. Um, and if we just think about that, I mean, when we think about an organization, there are millions of interactions taking place every single day across sectors, across you know, these different tribes, these different departments. And we're missing the opportunity to um, tap into those interactions, to align it to, to, to known knowns. The known known is that actually um, uh, capturing feedback on each other and crowdsourcing a sense of self uh, understanding the competencies that people are displaying and attitude that people are saying doesn't just help our career planning. It also drives behavior because one of my favorite examples is the trip of, um, is the, uh, the mystery shopper. I don't know if there are anyone uh, listening in that's ever worked in a restaurant when they were younger. Um, I think it's about the most important thing any, any young person does because um, it's, it's an amazing way to, to, to train the mind in terms of your service skills. But um, when I was doing it, when I was uh, a lot younger, um, I was aware of the mystery shopper, and I don't think that person ever arrived, but every single day I worked to become the best version of myself because just maybe this person, in brackets, probably was never there, um, I thought might be watching me. I thought might be talking about me to someone in management, and so I became the best version of myself. And I don't mind that. There's no regret. I'm actually appreciating that because I think it was very, very powerful. So we can take all these incredible nudging technologies and we can apply it to the corporate space. I think we're going to see a transformation. And so I think we can turn from this annual appraisal of the dead um, to sort of real-time feedback loops, move some an aspirational thing to a real thing, and it really will drive the agenda as these workforces are changing. Excellent thoughts there. Thank you so much, Roger. I'm excited to talk about our next topic today, um, the innovation or the innovator's dilemma. I think this is something that we've probably all experienced, whether you know in our professional lives or also in our personal lives. The innovator's dilemma is the idea that in the early days, 
the challenges of making a new solution or a new idea live and thrive, um, people tend to be far more resistant. Once that idea or solution works well, suddenly everyone seems to be in support of it. But before it's proven in those early days, there can be quite a fair bit of resistance. So that's what we mean by the innovator's dilemma. And if you've ever found yourself maybe not saying, but just thinking, I told you so, you've probably lived that, that dilemma yourself. So let's talk about this next question that you all answered before this webcast. Who is the major blocker for transformational change in an organization? Most of you, a full third of you, said the C-suite, uh, and that was closely followed up by the workforce in general and middle management. So reflecting on these results and thinking about that innovator's dilemma, uh, David, what, would, what are your thoughts here on how we can collectively unlock change? Sure. Um, I mean, it's, it's a really interesting question. Um, and I think different companies are tackling that in, in different ways. But I think, you know, how we think about setting objectives and how we reward people um, are very much intertwined with, with, this, with this topic. So if, if you incent and reward people on the old way of doing business, you're just going to get more of the same. If it's more about, hey, how do we introduce um, products that clients really want? How do we service them better? How do we cross-sell more so, you know, we're actually able to, um, you know, introduce new products to existing customers with a greater success rate, that, that really changes um, the, the model around, around innovation within, within the company. So I think, it, I think it really does start with senior leadership. So I think the responses uh, through the survey, I think, are absolutely spot on. Um, and I think it's up to the C-suite to think about the incentive systems and how you link that to actually um, create an environment for you know, greater innovation, right? So it does start with the top. Now, I think to, you know, to take it down a, a few levels, um, you know, how, you, how you create that environment, how you foster it, how you create a, a desire to be innovative, you know, what are the capabilities that you're building inside the company, right? You just don't turn around to the workforce and say, okay, you 10,000 people um, get innovative fast, right? Um, you actually need to demonstrate that, one, there's a real commitment to this, right? So creating awareness and desire to be part of the innovation is a, is a very foundational step. Um, then creating the, the, the capabilities and the knowledge to do that, right? So it, it could be, you know, I'm making this up. You, you want to create more um, process automation, right, an area, you know, area near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, creating that capability inside, you may want to say, hey, why don't we start with introducing more, you know, Lean Six Sigma capabilities so people become more process aware, they're able to analyze. You're giving them tools and, and best practices to help them understand how to improve process to drive greater innovation. Then introducing tools like robotics or whatever, it could be anything, but introducing the tools to actually help them become more innovative is, um, is enabling the workforce to achieve that objective. At that point, you know, the, the recognition systems will come in line. So um, this is a great question. I feel, I feel like it pulls in the other questions really well. But if, if you have that top-to-bottom alignment of, you know, we as a firm want to become more innovative and bring more innovation to market, you can do that structurally and culturally. It's, it's not that difficult. You just need to commit yourself to it. Um, but again, I, I think a lot of this comes back to um, incentive systems, uh, goals and objectives, performance appraisals. Um, so it, it becomes embedded in the culture, and it's not just a, a program, but it's how you do business. So I, I, it's, a, it's a great question. I see some firms doing it extremely, extremely well, others not so much. But from, from my experience, um, I, I, you know, if, if you're creating that, that alignment and you present a good idea and it's presented in the context of, of the objectives that the company wants to achieve, whether that's top line growth or margin enhancement, if you present it in the context of those, um, the parameters that are relevant to, to the C-suite, I, I really yet to see 
um, and this could just be me, but I've yet to see good ideas that enable a strategy or, or help deliver on commitments get shot down. I just don't see it. Now, that takes more work to align stakeholders. You just don't, you know, write an email and send it and, and cross your fingers. It takes a lot of hard work to, to drive innovation and sustain it and to break through, right? There's a lot of noise and a lot of clutter and a lot of business as usual stuff. Um, so it takes real perseverance if, if you're really committed to it. But if, if, it, if it's compelling um, and you can capture it in a way that aligns to business objectives, your chances of success are actually quite good. Great, thank you, David. Uh, Adrian, could you share a little bit about uh, the middle management piece? How um, can middle management play a greater role in transformational change? Uh, poor middle managers, right? It kind of feels stuck in, stuck in the middle, and it's uh, it's one of those things that I think there's a lot of rhetoric about how you know tough it is, and kind of you know sort of can't go up and can't go down, and you're in this space of being in between an individual contributor, but yet not having sort of this this uh, situational authority, and and so I think, but I think we can change that view. Um, it's a tough spot, no doubt, and as David said, it can be a lot of work to be in the middle and drive change um, to make a case and to get through some of the, the standard systems and processes that are, that are sometimes in the way of that. Um, but it is a very unique perspective, I think, to sit in the middle. Um, there's actually you know, some great leadership work here, too, that says when you're in the middle, your vantage point is so much stronger because you can look forward and see well enough ahead what's happening with leadership and, and beyond. And you can also look back and really understand what are the challenges happening in the day-to-day -day work and what is the, the skill and talent that's coming up behind. And so it's, a, it's actually a very powerful place to build from and to, um, and I think a tremendous opportunity to create bridges. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean the environment is always as conducive to that, but I do think that there's much more empowerment that can, that can happen in sort of taking charge of and enjoying that space than I think we often hear about. Um, but I think also to, to David's point, if we look at what's happening with management incentives and, and the senior leader incentives, I should speak more clearly about. And interestingly, to see how we responded about the board and only putting sort of 9% of them being blockers. To me, there is a broader issue here about governance. And, and I think, you know, if I can be so bold to talk about stakeholder um, um, versus a shareholder view, but I think when we have so many organizations, particularly those that are public, are feeling so beholden to the short-term results. And, and that drives the behavior of the board, of the pressure that they're putting on the top, and, and therefore what gets driven through the organization. And sort of a very um, strong catalyst for, for staying who we are. We need to maximize in the short term. And so what I'm seeing is this, and hearing so much more, and seeing so many more success stories, they take into account much more of this stakeholder view, not shareholder, but stakeholder. So stakeholders being everybody in your ecosystem. So the employees, the suppliers, your customers, the environment, communities we work in, and shareholders. But taking all of that together creates a more, I guess, long-term balanced view of how do we make decisions and how do we then think about risk tolerance when we have a longer-term view of of the horizon, and it risk obviously very much tied to how we think about innovation in organizations. So I don't know if, uh, how many of you might be familiar with the conscious capitalism movement, um, but Raj Sassota is a leader in this, and he points to so many success stories. Companies, um, more, more recent companies like Whole Foods and Trader Joe's and Container Store and USHG, and, and organizations that we feel like we can see and feel a difference. And we know that they're great employers. We know that they're trying to do better in the environment. And we as consumers reward that. And we want to keep talking to them and, and telling them what we like. And so by kind of voting with the pocketbook, we're showing organizations that we like what they're doing in creating more disruption and change and, and making things better. And I think that that virtuous cycle that is created in this, if I go back to kind of beating on the drum again about listening and asking, I think organizations like this are also very open to hearing from their customers. And so it's critical to ask and listen um, 
to, to your consumers, to everybody in your ecosystem, to think about those suppliers, because I think that's what helps organizations to innovate, to stay ahead of customer demand, and are able to adapt. And they really become a learning organization. And that, that is absolutely a core capability inside a company. Um, to be insular and closed means there's just not new ideas percolating, and they're sort of not having this, this it's maybe too strong of a border. Uh, so I think what's happening now, um, one of the organizations that comes to mind, I think about one of our biotech clients, and their philosophy and their culture has been about experimenting and piloting. And they have this philosophy that, that when you have processes and systems that are too rigid, checklists for everything, processes that allow for, for zero interaction, and actually take out the thinking that that they lose the innovation. So it's actually like this messiness inside a company, the need to bump into each other, and, and which makes us think, and it's that thinking that leads us to new ideas and innovation. It's very powerful. Um, so, so hopefully a few different things to think about there uh, of the different layers of where blocking can come, but also I think there's so much opportunity to move this idea that we are, that, that there's blocking of innovation when we can remove some barriers quite easily. Great, Adrian. Thank you so much. Roger, any final thoughts on accelerating change in the innovator's dilemma? Yeah, a few very passionate ones, I guess. Um, I, I mean, I'm conscious of the time, so I'll, I'll try to do a sort of short version of what, what I'm, I'm hoping to share. I mean, as someone that's built a number of companies over my life um, and worked inside large organizations, so I sort of might be defined as a sort of classic entrepreneur, I suppose, or, or entrepreneur in residence when I'm in a large firm. I am constantly bemused by the lack of sort of where the over, there's a huge amount of lethargy in an organization. Um, and then you sort of try to sit back as, as a nice person. You think, well, what's going on here? Um, and if you reference someone like um, Dave Logan, so um, for those listening, do, do check out Dave Logan, does a great TED talk. Um, he's concluded there are five levels of attitude. And in fact, 74% of a typical organization, so the bottom three levels, are people that aren't automatically, they don't have that collaboration sort of DNA in their body where they have to connect. And so I lovingly call it the, the, the level four and level five of people, so the 22% at the top of that sort of uh, attitude, I call it sort of connecting Tourette's. You just can't help yourself. Um, so it kind of goes back to win conditions because if we're thinking about an organization, the vast bulk of an organization, be it the management or on the, you know, on the ground or, or board, are people, there's a huge number of people that just don't seem to be wired to want to make so much change. And actually, if you think about that, that's okay because we are hardwired to think about fear and worry over um, over reward. In fact, we're, um, there's a gland in our brain that makes us seven to ten times think about fear more than reward. <clears throat> so this is why I was touching on the wind conditions earlier, because we have to think about a way. Um, to, unless you're literally clinically insane, every one of us is going to be motivated at some point in a different way. And we have to sort of uh, architects of change, if we're sort of looking at that nice turn of phrase, we have to acknowledge that and we have to go back to the psychology and try to think about these array of wind conditions in an environment that's encouraging people to innovate. Because go to the actual question, one of the challenges I think is that you have all these sort of exciting things to do, but the vast majority of people are just pulling against it. They're like anchors. And we have to try to make them turn it from sort of anchors and we unlock the anchor just and, and off we go. Um, I think the other thing to mention, which is a very, very big statement to make, I, I suspect, but you know, if we think about the typical board member, um, they are people that sort of they are defined as digital migrants. They they don't actually often understand technology in a way that they perhaps need, because most firms are now digital companies that specialize in an X. Um, so you know, a law firm is a digital company that specializes in law. But I, you know, I think we can we can rest assured that a lot of folk in law firms and accounting firms, financial services companies, aren't that close to tech. And that really needs to change. So, so there's a whole blend of things where I'm sort of, I guess, I'm optimistically skeptical in one way, but at the same time, just, just feeling that there is a there's a lot that we can do there if we want to make the change collectively. So, um, I think it's really interesting that the guys touched on, you know, um, especially Adrian, you touched on the fact that middle management can see forward and backwards, and I think that's very, very true. Um, but I think we have to look at every single stakeholder across the ecosystem and and find a way to encourage them to want to change, not just think about change. 
Thank you, Roger. Thank you so much. Before we get to our last topic here, I do want to just remind our HCI webcast attendees, there are a lot of great questions coming in through that Q&A interface. We're going to, um, when we wrap things up, we're going to try to get to as many of those as we can. But please go ahead and submit your questions. If we don't get to them live on the air, we will be passing those questions on to our panelists so that they can follow up with you offline. All right, so let's take a look at our final topic here today, hiring versus retention and the new borderless workforce. Let's talk first about hiring versus retention. Roger, what do those topics mean to you? Um, well, I think if you, uh, there's a recent Gallup st um, study that sort of presented that once again, engagement is incredibly low. Um, in fact, I mean, in the US, it's about a third only are engaged and globally it's about 13 percent um and this hasn't changed for over a decade or more it's it's kind of incredible um and then when you look at the real life of like barclays quite recently going on a hiring freeze and in fact i think deutsche bank recently as well what are these firms doing what's happening they're, they're what they're saying quietly is actually they can't afford to hire people but at the same time they can't afford to not keep moving so that when we think about it, what firm in the world has an effective model that allows you to move talent effectively around an organization? I have not seen one in my entire career. So I think what, what's really interesting with this sort of outline is thinking that perhaps, and this is just a humble subjective point, 80% of hiring should be made from within, but 20% should be coming from outside because I think you know, fresh blood is a very, very important part of the process. Um, and I think probably my last little comment to share is back to this con concept of homophily. Um, and think about diversity and inclusion, which is such an important topic. Um, it is interesting when you think about tech, because actually tech is, and you think about algorithms particularly, algorithms are the only non-sexist, non-ageist, non-racist thing in the world. So we really need to have things like algorithms as part of our decision process when we're thinking about hiring from inside and hiring from external uh, sources. Great, and Adrian, uh, let's turn to you. Who would you say are the winners and losers in the borderless workforce? Uh, just before I go there, I want to say to Roger, some may be surprised that just as I come from a, a search background, but I agree. Uh, I do agree that there, there are many organizations um, that need to be doing more internally um, to engage, and they're, they're going outside far too much. And actually, have some examples of firms that have called us describing something, and we can point them to somebody inside their own organization with exactly what they're looking for. And um, so definitely a need for that. And the algorithm piece that you pick up on, I think one of the things we're seeing in search too is this um, also much more focus on assessment at the executive levels and moving through uh, those pieces in, uh, deeper and kind of pulling more science into this process too. And, um, and so we're actually we're doing some work right now with recruiters and looking at how are they, um, how's the role of the recruiter changing internally so there's much more about them being marketers, data miners, career coaches, enablers of internal mobility, being a workforce planner. Right? This, there's a whole lot of things that are being impacted and shifting because of these influences of technology and about the, the more of a focus about taking care of talent internally first. Um, quickly on winners and losers in this borderless economy, I think starting with losers, people with static skills and low mobility is going to be tough. Um, companies that don't invest in development and don't take a hard look at the work and how it's done and where it's leading, and actually up to the country level, um, not having the opportunities to engage their workforce will definitely experience a brain drain. Thinking about it on a more positive note, winners are definitely organizations that can attract the best and brightest and keep them engaged. But I would say as long as it's meaningful for both, right? We're seeing in this more gig economy and that, that as Roger talked about, so many more contingent workers, those with transferable skills, they're tech and data savvy, they have ease of movement, probably a consultative and problem solving type of approach and expertise are definitely in demand. You see that even in, in an HR function. And we also see a more senior workforce and retirees matching with opportunities because they have more flexibility to move across these projects or doing in our own roles. And as organizations get more comfortable with that, it's very exciting to think about the levels of knowledge uh, that you can also gain from that. Mobility isn't just for the millennials. Uh, but I think, and also being able, as, as Roger mentioned, thinking about the diversity, right? Being able to engage, and I think this is definitely a win, being able to get, engage with people who might have left the workforce entirely, whether that's moms and dads or people caring for an ailing spouse or parent, 
Um, but these new types of working and thinking in very different models from just full time, it's a big win across the board. Adrian, I'm glad you mentioned algorithms uh, similar to Roger. So as we move on to David to wrap things up here today, um, with your experience with artificial intelligence and robotics, uh, how do you see the role of algorithms growing in importance as we move towards the workforce of the future? Sure. I, it's, to me, it's a really great question, and I, I'm going to echo a little bit of what Adrian was saying. Um, I, I think you're beginning to see more firms uh, use analytics and AI as, as a means to understand the, um, you know, of course, as I mentioned earlier, the activities that, that people are performing, but also what the sentiment is and the level of engagement um, across the enterprise. So I think uh, up until very recently, this wasn't possible. Um, but we're finally at a point where we can do a lot more uh, predictive analytics around where we expect turnover and you know where we're going to have a uh, more productive workforce and um, to me that's that's a really fantastic innovation and if your firms aren't using you know algorithms and AI to uh, to assess that and and put put in place um, you know proactive uh, mitigants to uh, prevent turnover of, of your best staff then you're probably going to begin to lose um, lose the war for for talent so I think, you know, the time for this is, is now, right? If you're not doing this already, um, there needs to be a conversation within your company about using data to become proactive around uh, retention and using data to help serve opportunities up to uh, those folks that you want to retain, right? Your high performers or people that you believe have, have high performance potential um, to ensure that, you know, you're getting maximum utilization out of them and they're having a great opportunity to do work that they enjoy and, and you know they're very much aligns to their uh, career interests so it's it's a real win-win opportunity um, it's not it's not uh, just science sitting on the shelf nice in theory but it's uh, it's real application right now that provides you know very measurable returns so it's uh, critically important I think for HR professionals Great, David. Thank you so much. I appreciate all of our panelists being here to share their experience and expertise today. We do have just a couple brief minutes before the end of the hour, so I do want to get to some of the questions that have been submitted by our audience members. Again, folks, if you do have any questions to submit, we're not going to get to all of them live on the air, but we will pass them on to our panelists. So be sure to get those in the Q&A box. Uh, this first question comes from James in the audience, and he directs this question specifically to you, David. So I'll ask you to start and then maybe Adrian or Roger would like to chime in. Uh, but David asks, uh, he mentions, you said people working on what they are good at is the way forward. And James' question is, with silos and strict roles, how can this happen in organizations? What are your thoughts there? Um, well, silos um, are, are uh, possibly a, a thing of the past. If there are regulatory reasons why um, work can't be shared across, then yeah, I, I get that. However, um, becoming more borderless, becoming uh, flatter, thinking more horizontally across the workforce is what you're seeing more and more of the best high-performing firms do. So if you have capacity and you have an interest to get work done, how do you find that capacity? Historically, it's been at the water cooler. Now we have tools where we can finally say, hey, I'm really interested in these sorts of opportunities. Let me go into this tool, this platform, this database to actually discover what those opportunities are that are actually tailored by me, for me, based on my interests. So putting you know, regulatory, legal uh, sort of questions aside, those, those sort of boundaries, um, it's, it's more possible than it's ever been. But it requires a new way of, of thinking, right? People are not the assets of the manager, right, they're, they're um, part of the company, and they should be viewed as such, not your mind and you can't do anything else, um, right? We should really be thinking more about how do we get our day jobs done, certainly, but where we have capacity, how do we tap into that in a way that aligns to that person's career interests? Adrian or Roger, any final thoughts there? Uh, well, just, I'll just very quickly say, yeah, I think I think there's a there's an issue with silos. Uh, you know, right now, of course, 
um, the world is moving to a slightly flatter structure, which is great to see. And so, you know, um, even Barclays, the back office function, we saw the sort of compliance function trying to get rid of silos in favor of flatter models. So as this happens, I think the, uh, the, the horizon for people to see and get involved with more pertinent tasks is better than ever. And that speaks directly to the L&D opportunities because, of course, they can participate in projects and tasks that actually are interesting to their future career as well, rather than just sort of reading manuals. And that builds their social networks up as they get involved. So I think companies really have to wake up and commit a sort of 10 to 15, maybe even 20 percent uh, of their time to staff to get involved with other projects as well. And I would just add, I think, too, is just in thinking about different workforce segments, that it's easier to picture some of these things with knowledge workers um, than it is with some others. So I think you know, there'll be some different solutions and some nuanced ways we need to think about it for different segments. Thank you so much. I do want to tell all of our panelists today how much we appreciate them being here to share their expertise. Uh, Adrian bigley fretz David Palmieri, and Roger Gorman, thank you all so much. I do also want to thank everyone at ProFinda, our webcast underwriter, for making this presentation possible today. We have come to the end of the hour, so we're going to wrap things up. If you do want some more information, you can take a look at upcoming HCI events by clicking the Attend a Conference link at the top of this page. And of course, the biggest thank you of all goes out to all of our HCI members. We appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day to spend with us and look forward to seeing all of you on another webcast soon. Thanks again to everyone and have a great day.